grateful that you're here. Uh, we're going to get rolling. If other people join us, uh, that's great. Um, but uh, I am thrilled. Uh, I'm Mark Scorsone. I'm um, the USM Assistant Director here at the Fellowship and also do uh, some of the youth stuff. Um, and so, um, so we're grateful to have you on. Uh, excited to have Dr. Fred Antonelli, who's also the new uh, Elam Bible Institute and College President. Uh, he's just moved up here a few months ago and getting settled in and being thrown into the midst of uh, the school over there and getting geared up for what uh, is happening at school. So he's going to give us a little bit of a update on that at the end. But today we're going to be talking about mental health. Um, and it was a hot topic before COVID. <laughs> and it's even uh, a bigger topic now. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, 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 stuff even with my kids, uh, with young young people when we're doing our youth huddle. Uh, so uh, nobody is untouched by this. So um, be ready to ask your questions, um, your thoughts to Dr. Fred as we get going here. But I'm just going to have him go ahead and start sharing with us um, some of the things, a um, couple things that I, I ran into. And this is a real um, uh, important issue to me because I, I have a, a son that kind of deals with uh, special needs and some of the stuff and uh, we have him on meds and things like this. So we've we've talked to Dr. Fred quite a bit. We have our own um, counselor and, and different things that we've been working through. We also, um, I was telling uh, Dr. Fred this, that at Saturate this past November, we did a hot topic with the whole, you know, a thousand kids there and um, it was, we did a whole hot topic on it, and it was such such a good thing that they want to do another one this year that we just talked about a lot of different things, even um, affecting young people. But uh, I was just reading up on some stuff, and it was interesting. I guess I, I don't know if I was really surprised, but they said 45% of people have been impacted negatively um, with the um, coronavirus and how the self-quarantine has really kind of changed their, their lifestyle. Almost 50% almost has increased their worry and stress and fear. And I could probably be thrown into that um, category as well. And that um, social isolation and loneliness, uh, 45, 47% of people have been affected uh, with that and just how um, that's uh, just birthed into more of their fear and things that are going on. So our, our country and, and people all over the world is really being impacted with this struggle. Um, our churches, our kids, our youth groups, um, uh, our, the workplace, job loss uh, um, has increased depression and anxiety as I read up on some things. Um, you know, a lot of people are worried. You know, a lot of fear is coming in. And and um, and uh, so I'm really encouraged to hear what uh Dr. Fred has to say to us. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn it over to him. So glad you're with us, sir. Uh, go ahead and share your heart. I know you're busy, so I'm super glad that you took the time to be with us today. And this is also going to be recorded. And if you ever want to go back to it or encourage your friends to listen to it, uh, just subscribe to our um, EF, um, our yeah, Elon Fellowship YouTube channel. And also I wanted to say hi to anybody who's on our Facebook live feed. Uh, we're on Facebook Live, um, and so they might be asking some questions as well. So, Dr. Fred, take it away. Uh, so glad that you're here. Hey, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate that. I'm just looking at Bruce down there in the corner in that beautiful background. I'm thinking, that's where I want to be. <laughs> just chilling back there, you know, just nice. It's amazing how you how that happens just like that, you know. <laughs> they got blue screens. Um, yeah, yeah um, I'm going to share a couple things, but probably I told – Mark, the thing I, I like when, oh, in all of my seminars and all that I do in speaking and, and what workshops and stuff is the Q&A, because I feel the questions are probably uh, the best part because it gives you an opportunity to ask anything that you want. I might not have the answer, but um, you, you know, you're the most important part here. So just to say that the uh, <laughs> COVID-19, right? <laughs> Who would have expected it? Who would have heard of it before that? Um, it came upon us like a thief in the night. Um, there is obviously, and one thing I don't want to get into is the political aspect of it, because everybody has different feelings about it. Clearly is a very controversial pandemic. Uh, the science is very controversial. Um, and so, but nonetheless, the reality is we are all 
subject to the governmental leaders that we have. And we have to follow those things because if not, well, it's, it's difficult. We certainly have to do it here at uh, EBIC. <clears throat> um, there is uh, there is a lot of different, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things I fight with them up here is allergies. Does anybody have allergies beside me? <laughs> oh, man. When you move to New York, it's... it's... <laughs> well, I had allergies when I was back there, but I'm telling you, I have... When I've flown up here at times, my feet are not even out of the fuselage of the plane when it hits me and then my nose is running. So if it sounds like um, I don't, I'm not sick. <laughs> you can't catch it over the internet anyway. And uh, my eyes are red, but I'm, I'm straight, trust me. Um, <laughs> um, relationally, uh, it can be a, a hit. Um, even good marriages, I, I get a lot of this. I mean, um, I'm not counseling really anymore. I keep my license up when I came to EBIC. I chose not to. I'm executive director of the Agape Christian Counseling because they were, um, uh, they were gonna shut that down a few years back. They asked me to take it over, but I'm giving that up in a couple months. So, um, but having counseled for long, as long as I have, I also pastored for 23 years. Uh, I deal with a lot of relationships. Mostly what I did uh, was crisis marriage situations. Uh, mixed with disorders or comorbidity and those things. Um, but when you have a relationship, say a marital relationship, and you already have difficulties, and you've already had issues, and all of a sudden the COVID-19 hits, and now you're sequestered in your house <laughs> with that person that you really did not, you weren't getting along with anyway, uh, it, it, exas it gets exacerbated. It really does. It becomes uh, uh, difficult. Um, separation rates are up. Divorce rates are up. Um, domestic violence is up. Um, so uh, abuse is up. Uh, alcohol abuse is up. Drug abuse is up. Um, so uh, this really throws a person into a tithy. You know, it, it, the, the, to throw somebody into a situation where they now have to be uh, put in a house or they can't work or they've lost their business or um, you're finding now you have to wear masks all the time. People who hyperventilate, people who have um, allergies, people who have uh, uh, respiratory issues. Um, I saw a guy coming out. We got here, we were back and forth at Lowe's, I don't know how many times. And uh, uh, there was a guy coming out, I don't know, probably in his, I'm guessing his 50s or something. And he just ripped the mask off the moment he came outside of the door. And he was just, he's having a panic attack. And uh, he was just looking at me with his eyes. I just happened to make contact with him. And as a mental health professional, I'm just saying, hey, listen, you okay? Went through a little CBT, had him calm down a little bit. And uh, um, he said, you know, I just, I can't take this. He said, I can't breathe. I'm, I, 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 I can't do this. And there are those, that population of people. So, um, and then there's those who say, you know, against my rights and others who just saying, I, like, you know, around here, I keep, I just keep forgetting it. Now I'm just keeping it in my pocket wherever I go because I just, uh, I, it's not natural. It, we, we like, we're not, it's not like, oh, I forgot my, 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 my cell phone. I got my wallet. I got my pants. Oh, well, like, now I've got to remember, I got to, I got to have my mask. That's another thing that, you know, people are having to do now. So um, it can cause anxiety. It can cause frustration. It can cause agitation. It can even cause anger. Um, so this is all real. And of course, none of that affects Christians, does it? Not a bit of it. <laughs> no. Christians don't get angry. They don't get frustrated. They don't get upset. They don't have opinions. And then when you have it in a home, you know, the wife or the husband might have a different opinion of, you know, than the other. And then that can cause issues. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, frustration on the rise and it, and it has hit um, like church. And you go to, now they're just starting. I'm from Maryland originally. I was here. I went to Elam from 74 to 76. But um, uh, Maryland, um, we, we were right by the ocean. And of course, that was a problem with some people. And, and uh, um, you know, they're just started. I think they had services down that you could attend church services before you can attend them up here in New York State. But now you can attend church services and there's a certain amount of people that can go in and you have to wear your mask when you go in, when you sit down, you can take it off. Other places you can't take it off. You have to worship with your mask on. 
Some people don't like that. They leave and go to another church because they don't want to worship with a mask on. So you can see where this can become very frustrating with people. Uh, so um, I, want, I want to pause. I'm going to pause off and on here. I'm just curious, does anyone fit into that category? If not yourself, are you aware of somebody that has? Have you had to minister to some people who have been like that? Um, and if so, you know, how has it been successful for you? Has it been frustrating for you and them? Is there anybody here who has had to do that? Nobody, huh? That's pretty good. This New York State is something else here, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, um, anxiety is playing a major factor in a lot of this. Most people, all of us get anxious for something. You know, I'm, I'm late, I'm anxious. You know, I forgot, um, you know, I walked out, we're going to dinner, I forgot my wallet, I get anxious, my wallet. Uh, or, you know, I've, I missed a doctor's appointment or the kid, my, my child just fell down and, I, and broke his leg, I think, anxious. There's, there's normal anxiety that, that comes with people. We're made up that way because it's an alarm system in our bodies within our, you know, uh, neurology. But then again, there are people who suffer with anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety. They just, um, they, they're anxious people. Uh, they think, they wonder, they, they, they uh, could it be, you know, there's no periods, not a lot of periods at the end of the sentence, just a lot of running, run on sentences or, um, um, or if that anxiety can turn into obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, they either, uh, they can't shut anything off or the pictures have to be a certain way. The doorknobs have to be checked a number of times, or they just, uh, you know, they, they have to have things right or, or orderly and, and uh, to, an, to an obsession. Uh, hoarding, just multiple different kinds of uh, obsessions. And so when you tack that on, this can become acute. Um, I, this is the second case. This is just kind of the worst kind of a case. I uh, had a, uh, a young man, two cases, a young man who had an obsessive uh, compulsive disorder from a Christian family. I think he was in his late 20s, maybe 26. And um, he, he couldn't shut his mind off because he was convinced that COVID was going to kill everybody. It's, it was a, you know, he, they caught the political China thing and all of that. And he was sh convinced now China was going to come in and they were going to uh, just uh, take over the nation and they were going to take over the world and, and, uh, and the whole world was going to fall apart. And, and he committed suicide. And um, there was another uh, young man that did the same thing. Well, that is an obsessive compulsive disorder with comorbidity of uh, not only generalized anxiety, but um, major depression. I believe the one guy was also, uh, one young man was also, um, um, he was bipolar. So these kind of things do affect the church. Yeah. I get in trouble sometimes, not so much anymore because some people go, uh, you know, psychologist, Jesus, that sounds to me like honest attorney, you know, a, a very difficult to get, or, you know, an honest car dealer. And so I would, uh, I would catch it. At also my pastoral background, they would kind of connect with that. And it's had some people go, you were a pastor. And why did you, why did you veer from the faith and go into, you know, mental health? Uh, you know, you know, you're going to die and go to hell. Well, um, I don't think so. I think I'm pretty good, but uh, there are these disorders in the church and we, and we face them. Uh, how many of you are pastors, missionaries? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Cause there's a lot of missionaries here. There's a few missionaries. How many have like parachurches or you, you work with churches or you do things within churches? Yeah. So, um, the, when you put an anxiety disorder in the midst of this, uh, this pandemic, which is, uh, what, okay, what is, what is anxiety? Let me just, what is, what is obsessive compulsive disorder? What is anxiety? Here's what it is. Fear. Fear is anxiety. Anxiety is fear. It's the same thing. If anyone has never been anxious to the extent where they felt that, you know, their heart was palpitating and or if they never had a panic attack, um, or they never had a uh, um, generalized uh, uh, disorder of anxiety, or even uh, maybe obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, then 
if you've never experienced that, then that's great. Praise God. I mean, that's wonderful. But there are people in the church that will say to people who are like that, and I hear, I've heard this a lot. Uh, hey, listen, if you were, you really knew the Lord and you were really serving with God, serving God and really prayed up and really moving in the spirit, you wouldn't have all this stuff. I had a guy in my, just one of several, I had a guy and his wife, uh, it was a marital situation and the guy was, uh, I don't have any other word, just a jerk. And uh, his wife, uh, he had kind of uh, verbally abused his wife because she did have a, 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 a anxiety disorder. And, and by the way, anxiety disorders are genetic. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, an anxiety disorder, the great likelihood is either your mom or your dad or your grandparent or your uncle Charlie had. So somebody had, had that, your brother, you know. Um, and so he said, uh, I, she has this thing, you know, she's always getting, she's always upset. She's always wringing her hands. She's, she's always crying. She's always worrying about the grandkid. And so he just was berating her, which was really getting to me. And, uh, and finally he said that thing about, you know, you just need to know the Lord and serve God more. I said, look, 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 look. Here's where you either get upset at me and walk out or you listen to what I'm saying, sir, because have you ever had a panic attack? No. I said, well, then you don't know what you're talking about. Because to have a panic attack is to have, um, in her case, it was genetic because she had several of them and she had had them for years. And I said, and, and what you're doing is, you know, there is, if Christ, this is Christ in, Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? So Christ is in me. You start berating me. I start berating you. I start pointing at you. I start you know, saying to you that you, you, you're not this and you're not that and you need to be stronger and I'm just knocking you. You're talking to the Christ in you. And um, uh, he began to, you know, slow up a little bit. But these things uh, um, are exacerbated in situations like this. None of us in this panel have ever experienced anything like this in our lifetime. None of our parents ever experienced anything like this in their lifetime. It was the turn of the century before the you know, Spanish flu and some others that this happened. So this is very, very different. And I know there's uh, there's the you know um, conflicting science and scientists behind it, but nonetheless, it's still a major thing in our country and they can't get around it. So I wanna ask, is anybody, uh, does anybody have any questions about the pandemic, uh, COVID in and of itself? Any frustrations you have, any frustrations you're having with other people or some conversations perhaps you're having with other people? Um, let's take a couple questions. Anybody know anybody that's struggling with it? Um, I have a question. I, yeah. I don't know if you can see me. There you go. Yes, Kelsey, I, I can see you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I think my question is like, I have a lot of people that come to me that don't have anxiety disorders, like haven't been diagnosed, but they um, have a lot of anxiety. Like they've had panic attacks, but they're very in the early stages of like, you know, they haven't been diagnosed. They haven't gone to the doctors or anything. It's just kind of something that's welling up inside of them. And maybe they never known how to deal with it or walk it out. Um, some of the questions I have is just how, like when people come to me, how do I best serve them and help them and love them like they're trusting me so they don't always want um actually I don't always know what they want but like how do I best is there questions to ask them to get them to like seek out help or to be aware that they have this problem or like how do I care for them in a way that's going to lead them back to health and back to the Lord without fixing them. I don't want to fix them. Sorry, forgot this. Did you all hear that? It was my phone. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Uh, so um, is it uh, Kelsey? Yeah. Kelsey. Um, so your friends, let me ask you, ask you a couple questions. Your friends, um, are they believers? Yes. Okay. Um, Most of them. Most of them. Most of them are. Um, with some of the, what are some of the concerns that they have about this? Um, I think just anxiety of like, 
uh, well, well, you said like anxiety and fear go together. So I think it's fear of the unknown or fear that they can trust God with something um, that doesn't make sense to them or that mm. they can trust God that things are actually going to be okay or uh, things like that. Are, they, are these people who are otherwise positive and upbeat? Um, I would say they're they're pretty. Um, sorry, I know I'm being broad because I'm like. No, that's okay. This is good. Like, this is good. I'm thinking of a couple pockets of people. Um, I think on one side there's a couple of people that yeah are upbeat and they're just feeling this for the first time, and then I have a couple mm -hmm. other people that come and talk to me that aren't believers and are pretty welled up with anxiety and fear and they maybe have always had that edge to them yeah um uh you know the ones who always have the edge to them well they're gonna you know they're, they're probably going to be a little more outspoken and and um, upset perhaps yeah <clears throat> but i think the ones who it wears on your believer friends I even, you know, I find this with, with Christians. It's been what, you know, it's been five, five months, a little over five months or something that we are on this. We as human beings are not built to not, in particular here in this, this country, the United States, to, to, um, to not walk in our liberties. Uh, I'm not saying that politically. I'm just simply saying, I want to go outside. I want to do this. I want to go here. I want to go visit my friend. I want to go see my mom and dad. In other words, we're, we're very free. We're, I'm going to walk up to somebody, shake their hands. Uh, in the Christian church, you know, especially charismatic Pentecostals, <clears throat> we, we hug. We, we, you know, we, we, we meet one another in, in close proximity. <clears throat> and when you don't have that, or that's been taken away from you, and you can't do it, and now you're in your church and you're looking at your church through the eyes of a, of a computer, and, you know, um, a preacher is preaching to a camera and the worship team is leading worship to a congregation, at least for now, what was prior to them coming in, where there is no, no congregants. Um, and you're left with, I'm, I've got to completely adapt my life, you know, now, now I'm sitting in front of, you know, a computer with my pajamas and some coffee doing church. It's convenient at first, but after a while you're going, I, I, this is... This is crazy. So it begins to <clears throat> wear people down, believers down. And uh, uh, the best thing I can say, and what I have said is, I mean, I'm not, I don't know. I mean, this came. Did it come from God? Did it got, certainly got allowed it. Uh, is it from the enemy? I'm not getting in there. It just simply, here's where we are. And um, one thing's for sure. And that is out of all of what's going on, even not only the pandemic, but what's going on in our streets, what's going on politically, what's going on uh, with uh, a lot of the, uh, um, um, the writings in Portland and, and other places. Um, this is interesting. Now, I'm just going to ask you guys, you might not buy this, but it's okay. But I got a theory. <clears throat> and uh, Miriam's mom and dad were part of this. Uh, this that is going on right now, uh, I, I can see God beginning to do something very powerful. And, and it's going to happen, I believe, very soon. I'm a product of the 60s. Okay, so my, I got saved in 1970 in the Air Force. But I was in the Jesus People Movement. And that started in 1968. It came on. There was the Charismatic Movement and then the Jesus People Movement, which was a bunch of hippies during the 60s and the drugs and the rock and roll and, and all of that stuff. We had, we had uh, a president assassinated, Kennedy, his brother, the attorney general, Robert Kennedy, assassinated, and Dr. Martin Luther King. So there was three great leaders that were assassinated in four years, something like that. Every, when Dr. King was assassinated, every city in the United States was on fire. Every major city. There was rioting in the streets there was not only that, there was, um, they, they hated the government. They, we had an unpopular war, the Vietnam War. They were pouring blood on their, on their draft cards. We were shooting kids on campuses. Inflation was up. Um, um, uh, they, uh, they, uh, there was anger and, and rioting and protesting everywhere in this nation. You couldn't even stop it. There was a, 
They didn't like the president that was in there. I mean, it was, it made this to some degree, you would have had to have lived there. It made this to some degree look like this isn't too much in comparison to the sixties. But what happened was this, this is the encouraging word, Kelsey, that I'm trying to give to people who, who uh, have that kind of an issue. What happened was with all of that disarray, God formed a vortex and that vortex was all of these protesting hippies. And I was a long haired hippie rock musician, drug addict is what I was during that time. And um, um, my, my wife, Debbie, I was dating her at the time. She and her brother led me to Christ. And so my life changed, but I was part of that scene. And God formed a vortex with all of that generation, which is out there now, the, 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 the uh, millennials and the Zs and all of that. And from that, people, all these kids began to realize nothing is meeting my need. The government does nothing. The drugs didn't do it. The free love didn't do it. The rock and roll didn't do it. Nothing. I'm nowhere. I'm firmly planted in air and I'm filled with rage and hate. God formed the vortex. The Holy Spirit came in. There was a massive revival. The last great awakening that the United States ever saw was that movement. Elam was so Elam had over 600 students in it. Took me, took me six months to even get in here. There were kids walking up to this campus and just said, I'm here. They said, but you're not supposed to be here. We don't have any room. I said, well, God just sent me anyway. We, it, was, it was crazy. There was no places. There was no apartments. Most of these buildings weren't even here. Um, uh, Mark's dad remembers it. I mean, it was, uh, it was amazing. All, every Bible college across the country, every evangelical Bible college was filled. What am I saying? And that was hundreds of thousands, millions. They grew up, they became the, the religious right. They put presidents and, and congressmen and women and senators in. It was a very powerful time. Um, the same thing is happening. Amen. I don't know whether you know it, but in Huntington Beach, California, there is massive revival going on. Right. There is revival going on in Minneapolis where George Floyd was killed. There is major revival going on there. There's parts of Texas that it, it, revival is going on. In New Mexico, there's revival going on. Just like in the Jesus People movement, it started at the West Coast and it moved to the East Coast. Matter of fact, they're even saying over there right now, I've heard, I don't know how many videos, um, what's his name? Shane, 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 uh, no, Shane Fowl, Fowl with Bethel, what's his name? Uh, Bethel Music. He kind of looks like Roger, Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin. He's got all this long hair, uh, you know, golden hair. But he's a big part of this. And there's some African-American brothers and sisters there. It's happening again. Some, it's almost like, you ever, you ever smelled rain before it actually came? You could smell it in the air. It's like, I, I smell rain here. You can see the clouds. It's not here yet, but it's coming. That's what's happening. And so... Amen. Calm way, uh, to calm anxiety, I find, is you have to settle yourself with God. And if you don't have God, you don't have peace. If you do have God and you suffer with anxiety, then that's a real thing. You've got to take a look at that. But a lot of people have no peace. And if you don't have peace and something to hold on to throughout the storm, then anything could throw you for a loop. I believe this is all, for, uh, this is all happening um, for a, a major, major revival um, that we're going to have in our nation. It's, it's horrible. You know, a pandemic is, is terrible. Um, I know people have lost their businesses and, and, uh, and the government monies. You can only, only so many checks you can write out to people. But you've got to trust God because throughout all of the scripture, and if you look at history even, after the Civil War, after World War I, after World War II, and the Korean War, Vietnam War, during the Vietnam War, there was, there was always revival. Even in, and I'll, I'll stop here. I'm taking another question because I don't mean to preach, but I think this is a, this really reduces anxiety. And that is, um, uh, anytime there's been a major um, a problem in our nation or any nation, there's, it's always been proceed, uh, preceded with revival. And uh, you look in, the, uh, you look in um, Habakkuk, no, not Habakkuk, but the judges, the book of Judges, it's like, what, 350 years, I think, that, that the book of Judges, that's how old it is, somewhere around there. If you look, there's five times, I believe it says, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. <laughs> 
Well, that's because the children of Israel were doing, they're just sinning and doing their own thing. And they were serving God. Then they weren't serving God anymore. And they were just living life the way they ever wanted to live it. And then they, bad times hit them and they cried out unto God. And each time God sent them a judge and each time God sent them revival. That's how gracious and loving God is. So when I think of these things and I study these things and I see them, I, when I get upset, you know, like I'm, I'm not even supposed to be here on this campus. I'm supposed to be out raising money. I can't even go into these states because New York, I think New York state only allows like 10 states in the whole union to come into the state. And so it gets frustrating. I'm not supposed to be here. I have to cancel trips. And I'm going, this is crazy. This is frustrating. You know, I'd like to go, you know, take a bat and hit a tree or something like that. But then I realized, God, you're, you're on the move. So um, anxiety, You've got to combat it in various ways. If not, uh, it can grab you. And the next thing you know, you're, you, you, the enemy wants, you, enemy wants you to feel hopeless. Like somehow there's no end to this, but there is. And there will be. It's good. It's good. Maybe you've got uh, another question there for Dr. Fred. Yeah, one that, I don't know if you hear me. Uh, we've got technology problems. No, we got yes, sir, I can, hear, I can hear you, Corey. Um, I think one of the big challenges we have is we're in North Carolina and uh, we have four kids. Um, and at first it was, we didn't see a whole lot of a change because we, we homeschool all four of our children. So we don't go anywhere anyway. Right. So, um, but uh, yeah, obviously then church shuts down. Right. So now, now we don't have kids church anymore. Um, then the dance shuts down. Right. So no more ballet, no more art class. Um, and now we just recently lost, a um, our piano teacher, he's not doing, not going to be doing lessons anymore. So they were doing it virtually. So one of the, I think challenges that Ann and I are facing is seeing, um, there's Ann, um, it's really seeing some, uh, depression, right. And our kids, um, you know, and then I'm, you know, I know if we're facing it and we're homeschooled parents, so we're kind of used to the isolation and, and in a sense, um, I can imagine others. And then just this week, North Carolina started announcing each county is kind of doing things a little bit differently. Um, just as an example, the county we live in is doing a, a AB model for school. So, um, you know, kids either go Monday, Tuesday, or they go Thursday, Friday. Uh, well, now parents got to figure out how in the world, you know, we're already struggling financially. Um, how in the world am I going to be home two days for my kids? Right. right. Um, the county right next to us where our church is, Alamance County. Um, they had decided to do a virtual the whole semester. Um, so there you go. You got, you know, you, you, someone's got to be at home all the time. Um, and then another challenge that we're facing, which I think it's unique to maybe our family, our church is, um, you know, we go to one of the largest churches in the state and we have a thousand, over a thousand people um, that meet regularly. Um, we're nowhere near being able to open. Um, so we're kind of in that weird place. Okay. You know, other big churches are looking at January, right? Um, so do we go find a church, another church for six months? Like, do we go get a, find a smaller church that can meet? Um, you get some, try to bring a little bit of normalcy back to our family. Um, you know, and then we're really seeing how, how it affects our kids. And, and there's really nothing we can, I mean, obviously we can pray for them and love on them and, and talk to them about the situation. But uh, I think that's probably been, I don't know if Anne would agree, but I think that's probably been our biggest challenge to this whole pandemic is just how in the world do we, you know, manage, help, help manage our kids' emotions, right? Stuff they're going through, their feelings. So, Corey, that is, uh, um, Andy, do you want to add anything to that? Hold on. Okay. Sorry, we're sorry. having technical oh, issues. No, it, it's interesting that he brought up that point cause that, that actually would have been my, um, what I would have wanted to discuss as well as, is the kids. And I think in many cases, um, for a lot of individuals, they're not even really recognizing in their children the symptoms. Uh, like for our nine-year-old, it's presenting as irritability. You know, she's just annoyed at everything, which she is not normally that way. Um, and I think in, in this situation, parents are dealing with their own 
-hmm. frustrations. And I think the children are in, in a lot of cases are getting overlooked. Um, it, it's not recognized that they're, you know, they're dealing I don't know if we lost you there, Corey. Oh man, that was such a good question too. The Cummings, my name's, you guys there? Yeah, we're here, sorry. It's, okay, it's, hey, that's okay. I know it's gotta be, fr it's frustrating. Well, they're both good questions. Um, <clears throat> I would answer it like this for whatever it's worth. I mean, really good questions. And the kids are being overlooked because when uh, I know with, we had a uh, life counseling center, I started that in, uh, in Maryland. Actually, it's weird because when I left Elam here, we went and we pioneered, we, we church planted in, in Wilmington, outside of Wilmington, North Carolina. So we were there for eight years. Uh, uh, a little place called Burgall in Pender County, uh, not too far from the ocean. Um, but we had uh, five offices in uh, the Eastern shore of Maryland. And we had two therapists that were child therapists. And, um, and they present different than adults, obviously, kids do. And so they can be overlooked very much so. And, and so I'm glad you brought that up. I'll come back, Corey, to yours in just a minute because there can be depression and kids can get depression. It's not natural for children to not play with children. It's not natural for them to not have human contact, to be able to do what kids do and right. just kind of gallivant and have fun. And you know, they, it, this is, this is, since man has created, we are we're adapted to do this thing, kids. So when they don't, when they're looking at virtual friends and they're talking virtually, even though kids are always on the internet and we complain about that, at the same time, they have to have interaction. Um, and and uh, this is, we're finding that there are more depressions with children. We do this thing called child play and, and, and they, and, therapists are trained to be able to pull out from kids if they're depressed or anxious or if they've had trauma in their lives or this kind of thing. Um, kids must have interaction. And, and you said something, I don't know whether it was and you or Corey, I think it was Corey, you, you mentioned something about you go to a large church and, and you're wondering, they don't know when they're going to be starting and you're wondering if you should go to a smaller church uh, if indeed they're interacting right now. And what I would say with the deepest respect, and as a former pastor, um, I've already talked with people and they talk, they talk with me about this. Uh, I know people that are going, for this very reason, they are going to smaller churches that are doing some, you know, we're here, we're interacting some, and um, we're doing some things with family, social distancing, picnicking, you know, the kids are trying to do the best we can, uh, keep them from playing, you know, like close up, but at least they're in proximity. I think that is a very good idea. And I know people that do it. I mean, it's not that you're going to be, you might come right back to your larger church when it begins to start again, or where they begin to really uh, uh, ramp up. But uh, you need to do everything you need to do as mom and dad to make sure that your children are, have some kind of interaction, hiking, or, um, you know, um, you go to the park, uh, you know, I don't know whether you're some some families bring their kids and they say, look, kids, let's just try to keep as much distance as we can. Kids are pretty good about that kind of stuff. But if they're not, if they can't be with children, their whole life is in the house and, and it's just them and their sister or them and their brother. And, and uh, it, you're finding that they are distant or they're irritable or they're moody um, or they're not talking that much or they're rebellious or they're crying. This is, these are signs of depression. You know, and uh, they need, it's, it's, it's different. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be, I'm not going to get political here at all. Okay. So I'm not, I can't do it, but um, there does need to be um, social human interaction. It doesn't have to be touch and feel and, and um, you know, where kids are just all over one another, you know, wrestling and all that stuff. But if they don't have something, that is beyond just this thing right here, then it's going to rub against the natural grain of their prefrontal cortex, which also has the pleasure center, which means that I'm, if I'm playing with somebody and I'm having fun, I, I, then my serotonin levels are up and I don't feel as depressed and I don't feel, in other words, kids, that's what kids do. 
And uh, if not, then all they have is themselves and the television and the, and the dog or the cat or, or the four rooms or walls and it gets to them. So I would say do anything you possibly can do within reason to have your children uh, interact. Is that possible, Cummings, in any way with, uh, with you all? I'm, I'm just going to speak because I think I'm actually working. Um, the, for short term, the answer is not really. Uh, meaning short term, meaning the next couple couple weeks. North Carolina, um, the governor's extended phase two, and, and as I understand, phase two is that um, no gatherings more than ten people, right? Um, so you, you get our family, and we're six, right? So I mean, we got four or less. To, I mean, so but I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks um, we can I guess, I know, legally I don't know, legally meet with a smaller church and get our kids run other kids. Uh, we do have, we, we're, we're planning a vacation coming up. Um, I mean, whether it's right or wrong, whatever, we're, we're going to do it. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going down to Orlando um, and all, everything's uh, half capacity and um, half price. So um, there you go. Um, so the, hopefully that'll be a, a good thing that we're doing in two weeks from now. Um, and I think that if, if our church makes the decision that, you know, during phase three, that they're not going to reopen, um, we do have other churches in the area that we have connections to. We have either family or friends, or, you know, that we could plug in. But I guess my biggest, my biggest fear there is just if we start getting connected with a smaller church, um, you know, we, I don't necessarily want to abandon our, our pastors or the other church either, you know, because if they get, in, you know, six months is a long time right? Four months, especially in the kid's world. Um, you know, I, I hate to jerk them around too much, but at the same time, I think there's a, there's a cost to not doing it. Right. And, and that's kind of where we're struggling. Yeah. If I may, and, and I say this with all due respect, um, and as a former pastor, it's not about the church. It's about you and your children. Yeah. And what is the best thing for you and your children, your children, or beyond the church. I mean, pastors and churches, and there are some that's open and some aren't opening and some are large and so we can do it. And the offerings are good online. I have talked with pastors. I mean, the offer, offerings are good. And, and I, I, I mostly, I counsel a lot of pastors across the country. Most of them are large churches. Most of them are young, younger pastors. And um, um, offerings for the most part, there are some that are down as a result of this, but a lot of churches are up. And right. so these large uh, churches can still maintain and they might not open up for the next three months or eight months or after the first of the year, or some of them, some are even talking about not opening up until the spring or something like that. Um, but it's not about them. It's about me and my family and what is the best thing for them. And so if I go to a smaller church that happens to be interacting some and doing some things that all of a sudden I find that my, my, my children aren't as moody, aren't as irritable, aren't as agitated. They seem to be a little more upbeat because they're getting some interaction. Then that's the best thing to do because, um, and then if you go back to your large church, I'm not, I'm not trying to proselyte into another church, but I'm saying if that's, that's great, you can go back hanging on and leaving them hanging on they'll survive it's your kids and your family that is the most important thing and if you right. do that god will bless you yeah and that's super helpful thank difference. you for that yeah yeah you bet you bet buddy because it, it's uh you know i'm not gonna do it <laughs> I, I could really get political and i can't do that right now hey, all I Corey, Corey, and Ann, i just want to well fred's catching his breath there and not going political um i just want to let you guys know that we did uh, parenting through the pandemic huddle um, just a couple weeks ago and uh, you can get that on our, our, our YouTube channel um, there's some great questions uh, some great conversations um, so maybe if you check that out you might be able to find some things because there were some really raw questions about you know our kids and parenting and just uh, how they're really hurting through the whole thing so uh, find that as a resource I think you guys uh, might find some good uh, nuggets in there yeah, I might also say that, and this is a, um, I hate to see this, but I've even in our practice, uh, yes, I sold the practice, but uh, um, in, within the mental health field, there have been children they've been putting on antidepressants. Right. Now, I, I'm, I'm for that under extreme cases, you know, it, it just depends. But when you're, when these people are putting their children on antidepressants because of some of the very reasons you're talking about they've been in the house they've not been around children they've not been around uh some some parents have bought you know like a dog or a cat so they could you know connect with 
um, but they're finding that they're acting out and they're and they're presenting as really depressed, and they've had to give them antidepressants, and that um, that just can become that's when parents really need to begin to uh, uh, you know take a stand. I know North Carolina is a challenging state, and uh, and I know you all want to do the right thing when it comes to what they're expecting you to do there, and I would never say not to do that. But there, it, there, there comes a time, and I'll just leave it at this. There comes a time when you're looking at your children and you're going, you know, we both feel the same way. We, we have to do something. Then you have to do something. And if you do something, to whatever degree you do that, and every degree you make that shift, and, every, and it, to whatever degree they are interacting to some extent, you will prosper from that. They will prosper from that. When they prosper from that, to whatever degree, you're going to feel better about it as well. And, and we have to realize that even when church is open, the last thing that's going to be open is kids' ministries because of just the different protocols and safety things that um, I know our church is open without some outdoor services, but the kids' ministry isn't really happening um, just because of the safeguards that need to be in place. So you have to be aware of that as well. So even if your church opens, kids' ministry might not be opening up as quickly. Yeah. Jennifer, did you have your hand up? Did you have a question? Yes, um, um, I work in Bosnia Herzegovina. So uh, oh. people here have gone through war, most people. Um, so uh, it was um, interesting for me, uh, for some people, uh, like they're very adaptive because they've been through uh, difficult situations before. Uh, but some of them said that they felt this was worse. They felt worse. Oh. Uh, uh, this then in war in four years of war. So, um, and then and and you know here we deal a lot with uh, PTSD and um, mm -hmm. it, you do think that the situation can bring a, about uh, PTSD and how do you then um, try to help people to get help? Yeah. Well, that's what? such an excellent question, uh, Jennifer. Um, it is PTSD, and the, and I believe there is post-traumatic stress disorder uh, when it comes to this. But I will say this also: we, ha our executive vice president and provost Denota Case, it was from Poland. He was born and raised in Poland. You know, you know Denota. Okay, you see him. Okay, I'm, I can't hear you because you're, you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. But, I will unmute. <laughs> yes, I know her. Yes. Well, she. We were just saying at a PC meeting, a uh, president's cabinet meeting uh, yesterday, and. Uh, she was talking about, you know, she was raised under the communist regime and how taking all these personal liberties away from you, even though we've got to abide by the state in particular as a school and accredited college, we have to do this. But it, she said it feels like, and that's what PTSD is, it feels like I'm, I'm here, this isn't communism, this is not a big problem. I do have, still have more freedoms than anything else, but it feels like somebody is taking this away from me. And so that is a form of PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, uh, if as a child, so, so when you've taken Eastern Bloc country and um, some of the people who have lived under those regimes and, and they're saying all of a sudden now they're telling us what we have to do and we can't do and what we have to wear and we can't wear. Uh, like, you know, I go into a store and people, no, you can't come in here unless you have a mask or you got, you know, the mask marshals and everything else. It, um, it all of a sudden you feel what PTSD is. It's like, I feel like I'm back there. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not here anymore. I'm back there because it feels like that. And so that's when we have to ask the, the Lord, say, Lord, I need to ground myself to realize, um, Father, help me to know and live in the now. Mm -hmm. Because if I don't live in the now and, and look at what you're doing in this hour with me, the enemy is going to taunt me and constantly try to bring me back from where I was and everything will get out of perspective, which will increase anxiety, which will increase depression, which will increase to a degree hopelessness. Some of these people who have had this PTSD, it's almost like the Holocaust uh, when a lot of those people were alive, um, they would come in and anytime they saw someone who even looked Aryan or someone who had light hair or someone who maybe triggered them, reminded them of somebody who who took, you know, threw them out of their housing uh, or they were, they were, if they were in prison or something, they lived that every single day. Now, some might go again, hey, Jesus, he takes care of all that stuff. You don't have anything to worry about. You know, you just keep trucking on for Jesus and loving Jesus. You're never going to worry about that stuff. You've obviously never been traumatized. 
And if you have been traumatized and you're saying that, then you are, you are just numb to what really it needs to be done. I mean, yes. uh, uh, it's like, um, I personally believe if I can give an analogy to so Jesus died on the cross, uh, you know, Peter, you know, denied him and all that. I'm not going to preach to preachers. He felt pretty bad and he's, he's going off. Jesus is hanging around for 40 days and at, toward the end, he's there on, on the side of the beach and the, and Peter and those guys are out there fishing, have been all night. And, um, I actually have this in my book struggling well. Um, and, um, they didn't catch anything. So they got this guy on the beach saying, hey, listen, go cast the net on the side and go get some fish. And so they were going, you know, I'm thinking, you know, you're going, we've been at her all night, you know, and you're telling us to do this. This is crazy, but I'm desperate. So I throw it out. They uh, catch some fish and John, it was that took a look and he goes, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. Well, Peter, you know, the scripture. So Peter, it says he, he wrapped himself up and he dove into the water and he was, you know, swimming toward the shore and we're thinking we i we this is a theory by the way i don't know i'll ask peter in heaven but we think oh man he was just so stoked to see jesus boom in the water he goes he's swimming he just can't wait to get to jesus he's just you think about it you denied him you cursed him you said you had nothing to do with him you wanted nothing to do with him you've been asked three times three times you denied him and the last time you cursed him are you in a real hurry to get to that guy? Especially when you know, you know, I'm going to get to you and, and you're going to know everything I've done. I, I personally think he was in shock. That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. It's like when you shoot a deer, you're off and running sometimes you know, until they fall down. I think he was in, where is he going to go? He can't get in the boat and go anyplace. Jesus walks on water and come and run after him if he wanted to, you know, so <laughs> he's not going to do that. Uh, so he, he, and then he has this conversation with Jesus, the, you know, the three, do you love me? Do you love me things? And uh, Peter was wrecked. I believe he had PTSD. I believe he was, I mean, he, he just was, you know, look what I did. Look what I, I gave up. I was the guy who said that I, I gave up. And Jesus said, you know, rather than disqualify him, rather than preach this thing out, you know, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And feed my sheep. It must have been really crazy for him because he's going, I just did something horrible. But he, rather than disqualify him, he commissioned him. So, but there was a, a post-traumaticness about that. And I believe Paul carried that same post-traumatic thing. And he had, we have to deal with this from Saul, the guy who was putting people in prison and also had to do with them being killed, Christians, to in the prison epistles, um, he becomes very um, morose and he's, he's not the Paul in the book of Acts. He's in prison, you know, so he's sequestered. <laughs> You know, and, and so he's thinking, you know, he, when he, when he talks about in Romans eight, you know, you know, Lord, you know what the thing I find I should do and I don't. So he struggles with this. He struggles with, you know, all the things that he did. Uh, his grace is sufficient for him. I would say to you, Jennifer is um, if now you're talking, I would imagine you're talking about uh, some older people, people are in their, you know, older adults, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Them, do, yeah. do they uh do they have a, do, do they have counselors there to where they can go to not really it's really not um and and it, there's a stigma with mental health mm. issues like going to a counselor it's it's a sh shameful if you go to to speak to somebody it's changing slowly um mm -hmm. and we have young one young woman in the church who just uh finished her psychology degree so i'm i'm encouraged that it's changing but it's still it's very hard for people to admit they need help professional help because it's a stigma yeah it is a stigma and I, when you look in some european places it, it, it even is, is more so um you know, so if you have some people, and this gal's getting her degree, the, you know, I find with many people who struggle with PTSD, have a trained therapist talk with them. It does worlds of good. And then if there's medication, I don't know what it's like there, but if there's medication or SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake enhancers or antidepressants, they can be tremendously helpful during times like this. Um, uh, but, you know, or even, hey, look, you know, even they can do some uh, counseling, uh, over zoom with some people if, if there's people that you know of maybe set something up or we can set something up here i can talk with mark and there's counselors that can do that um because there is help 
it's very difficult if, if they feel hopeless, but if they feel that there is some help available, even with the stigma that I, if I tell somebody that means I'm weak, uh, you know, just to play on them, you know, well, that's, you might think that, but that's, uh, you know, Jesus is all about talking and opening up and communicating and sharing. And when we worship in the spirit, we do the same thing. And uh, if you'd like to talk about it, um, there's help for you. And uh, you and Christ-centered help. If not, then all you have is what you you're experiencing right now. If that's good enough, and you like that, or you're okay with that, then that's fine. But if you want uh, help that can really uh, tend to be um, um, very release you from the um, you being so um, depressed or anxious, then it's available. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Is that that's where you're at right now? Know. What's that? You're you're over there right now. Yes, I am over here. Yeah, I'm, okay. I've been here through the the COVID crisis. So, thanks for all that you're doing over there, Jennifer. God yes, God. indeed. Uh, I know we're getting short on time here, but I want to just uh, if someone else has another question or comment for Dr. Fred, go ahead, Miriam. Hi, thanks. Um, mine's kind of a, a two part question. Um, I recently read that there's a difference between a panic attack and an anxiety attack. And I'm wondering um, if that's true. Um, I'm wondering um, if you can explain the difference between them and then I can ask my part two question when you're done. Sure, sure. Um, Well, it depends. A person can be anxious or have an anxiety attack. So the terminology can be similar, just depends on the clinical setting that you're looking at. A, a, a anxiety attack can be, um, my, my child is over there and she's playing with another child and look, this guy's pit bull just got loose and is sniffing around these kids. Now I'm, I've got an anxiety, I'm, I'm extremely anxious because I've got to rescue my child. Not that the dog's coming over, but you, you're very, very upset. There's a, there's a lot of anxiety that's built up in that. Or, or you know, uh, you know, I don't have the, the funds to be able to pay for my rent or my house payment or, or have a grocery money or bill money. That can be anxiety driven to where you just feel like it's, it's a little shocking. Panic attacks, or um, they are, they can be much more severe. Panic attacks. When a person has a panic attack, it's almost completely uh, debilitating. It affects every atom in your body. You 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 feel like you're having a heart attack most of the time. As a matter of fact, that's the first sign, the first thing that people say: "I'm having a heart attack." Um, I, I can't breathe. It's like it's like an elephant's on my chest. Uh, I, I don't know what to do. And when it's not at all, you're not having a heart attack. You're having a panic attack. They feel there's no hope. Um, uh, I feel lost. I have no options. Um, I, I, I every where I turn, uh, I, I, there seems to be no help. It comes out of nowhere. Sometimes panic will go like I, I wasn't even anxious. I didn't even have a problem. And all of a sudden, it hit me just like that because it's underlying and it's been in your cranium for some time, just kind of percolating. And uh, that it can happen in the middle of the night. You're asleep and then all of a sudden you wake up and you find it difficult. That's a panic attack. That's mm-hmm. the most severe anxiety a person can have. I was just dealing with somebody. Now to have one is an experience. To have one is like, if you have one, you'll never forget it. I, I, one client was, uh, I was talking with this client for two weeks and they were having like four to five a week. He had three in one day. That's panic. And there's, and there's some underlining things that he was all, he was also, there's a lot of anxiety. He was depressed. Uh, he had, he was on, um, he was on a synthetic drug methadone because he was an opioid user. And, and so there was uh, some other lining comorbidity going on, but that's the difference. I can be anxious, and now when I see pit bulls, now I'm anxious even more so and, you know, kind of thing, or, you know, I'm very anxious around certain people because they remind me of my father or something like that. And I was abused by him. That's anxiety. Um, uh, panic attacks are worse. And they often come from um, other comorbidity, which could be uh, social anxiety. It could be um, anxiety ridden. 
uh, generalized anxiety and um, ADHD, you know, bipolar, it could, it could be caused by some of these things. So th does that answer your question, honey? Yes, um, and my, my part two is actually goes along with what you're saying now. Can, can an anxiety or a panic attack be related to uh, grief, like your body's natural response? Um, like say you, something traumatizing happens um, or you lose someone or you know, there's a sever and you know, close relationship with someone and you have one of these attacks after a few days of just feeling like numb or just trying to mentally process something, is that like, is that in a way um, your body's way of grieving or your body's response when you say you have a shortness of breath and you maybe um, start vomiting and just, you know, like sobbing uncontrollably? Is that like a, because I know that you said um, panic att or anxiety attacks um, are usually rooted in fear, but I'm wondering if grief can also um, be uh, if, if that's um, if an anxiety attack can come from your like a way of grieving, I guess. Yeah, well, um, if there's a loss and the, the, the person that you lost was very, you were very close with them, or there was a separation, or there was um, something that caused uh, you know a marriage or a, you know something that was was traumatic in, in a person's life. And uh, they they ruminate with that. Or they think. some see some people those people who express themselves very easily tend to deal with a little less anxiety though it is there. Those who internalize and like you know you don't know what they're thinking and it's like how are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. And they're internalizing it. They can't let it out. They tend to be more anxious and more depressed as a result of that. But it can happen. Like and if you lose something, lose someone, or it's it can be like the rubber band effect, you know, it's, it's kind of stretches, stretches, you're maintaining until it just, you know, it just snaps and you can become both so depressed and so anxious that, you know, it can, you can vomit, you can want to not go out, you just want to go in the bed and put the covers over your head and just not let any light in. Um, uh, you can grieve, you can cry. Um, that is, you know, deep sadness and depression mixed with anxiety yet yeah, all of that can happen but you have to be in a clinical setting to find out what is what is a panic attack what is an anxiety attack uh you know what what is uh, um, depression or how that is connected but it is possible they can do that even months later even years later mm -hmm. depending on they have a smell or, or they're in a they're in a place or they're they're with a person it reminds them of something uh that they were very sad about and they can all of a sudden go right back into a sadness or a depression. Okay. Is that, that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's interesting talking to her when I just remember her as a little baby. She's, just, <laughs> she's a great kid. I want to give opportunity if Scott or um, Bob, um, maybe Bruce, you guys haven't had a chance to share if you got any questions or thoughts. I just want to give you a, a moment here before we uh, close. Go ahead, Scott. I've heard mostly um, you talk about anxiety and depression, and I'm wondering if, are those two major categories, are there other major categories to be aware of? I don't know how, how mental health professionals divide up the various things. They're probably all connected or something, but I wonder if there are major categories that you can delineate for us. If we yeah, well, already. yes, sir. Um... You know, it, it uh, there are various disorders, and various disorders come with various symptoms, sym symptomatic things. So if there's bipolar, schizophrenia, bipolar, there could be borderline personality, there can be anxiety disorders, there can be ADHD. I mean, all of those have s some depression and some anxiety involved in those, um, uh, and some and and so really, depression and anxiety seem to be the two biggest things that people. Um, um, tend to deal with, but it, it comes in different stages. Uh, depression is in, you know, you don't have to be clinically depressed to be depressed. I mean, everybody gets depressed about things, you know. Well, case in point, this November 4th, the election may go your way or not your way. I don't know. 
but you may be depressed or you may be happy. You know, I, I don't know. That's not clinical depression. That's just saying things went bad, you know, and I didn't like it. Um, so um, anxiety, I mean, there's, there's so many variations of it uh, that don't necessarily mean that a person has a disorder. Uh, you know, people also can be very analytical, can be, uh, they, they find it very, they, they, they can't cross the T and dot the I because nothing's ever high enough for them. They set very high standards. And so they set high standards for themselves and they find it very difficult to set, to set the standard for other. So other people can't meet their standards and they can't meet their standards. That, that tends to be um, uh, somebody that tends to fall into like obsessive compulsive disorders or that's a form of anxiety. So I guess what I'm saying is those two particular categories are, are two that are often used. There is also uh, a spectrum of autism and these kind of things, which not everybody falls into. Um, but in one degree or the other, I would say um, uh, those two are, the, are two major areas that a lot of people deal with. And, uh, and they just, they, some people just feel like, I've had some people go, give me some, give me some medication. I just feel depressed. What, what, okay, what's going on? Well, I, I, I don't know. It hasn't been good with me and my wife and, and, you know, or I just feel depressed because the last couple of weeks, my mother-in-law is getting on my nerves and my, and my wife's thinking about bringing her in for a couple of weeks. I am I'm sorry. You know, I'm not going to get some medication. For that. You need to just realize that you need to, uh, you know, relax and, and do some other things. I, I will say this. I don't know whether I answered your question, but um, was, uh, did, I, did I answer that okay? Yeah, I'm, what I'm hearing is uh, that depression and anxiety are two of the, the major uh, symptoms that may or may not mean that you have a, a disorder, but everyone would, everyone would de deal with some form of depression or anxiety. But if it's, if it's to a certain degree or unmanageable, then you might want to look um, at what, what those are coming from, if there's a disorder that's causing those, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's true. Yes, that is. I mean, again, uh, to be plain about it and quick, everybody can be depressed and anxious. It's part of life. But to be depressed, anxious, to have, um, you know, panic attacks, to find that, you know, you're constantly in a depressed state, you're constantly in an anxious state, then you have to look at the environment. What's going on in my environment that's causing this? Is it environmental? Is it uh, from my learned behavior? Is it genetic? So that really takes a therapist to kind of look and look through that. But all of us deal with anxiety and, and depression. It just depends on how long we stay there. It's a place often people visit, but if it becomes your permanent address, then it's a problem then you have to really take a look at it and, and find out to what degree it, uh, it, it you know, it's, it's bothering the person. Great. Thanks, Scott. Bob or uh, Bruce, do you guys have anything to add or share or question? Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I think a couple other areas for me that I think maybe are tied in or related, maybe in addition to anxiety, and depression, which I've had my rounds with both of those, anxiety with work and so forth, but not so much anxiety about what's happening with COVID and so forth. But to me, the other areas might be anger or frustration. And I think myself, and I don't want to get political either, but my frustration and anger deals more with how the pandemic is being handled uh, whether I agree with it or don't agree with it. And I think part of that is because the situation changes on a daily basis. You know, we were in this flatten the curve and it was going well and things were going fine. And now all of a sudden we're getting outbreaks, which were expected, but you know, the cases are being more people are being tested and that sort of thing. Do you find that the, that anger and frustration or anything like that are also kind of tied to this as well? And one other question I had is, when you're talking about the revival that you're seeing, I was really not aware of that, but do you think that's due to panic or uh, anxiety about the pandemic or is it more anger and frustration, that kind of thing? And that's driving people to look for something deeper, you know, like a relationship, like turn to their faith. That's really good questions. <clears throat> um, first, uh, the anger people are, I, I've, 
I've counseled people already and talked with people who are very angry. And because they, when a person feels like they don't have any options, when a person feels like um, their, their answers aren't being answered, or they feel that um, they are having to um, lay hold of and follow through with statements and um, directions that they don't agree with, and they feel that it's, um, so they're being forced to do something they don't even agree with. Uh, not, not only just agree with it, they feel is um, that science doesn't, this one guy was saying that science is not clear about. In other words, this guy was talking with me about uh, um, different biochemists that actually train doctors, train medical doctors, and how there's a, a great deal of uh, biochemists that are not in agreement with the CDC. And, um, and so then when, they, when this guy was saying, you know, why should I listen to one person when I don't even agree with that? Well, then that creates anger. In particular, if this, this person is the kind of person, you, he doesn't like people messing with his rights to an extent. Um, so it does create anger. And anger is a form of anxiety. Actually, there's seven forms of anger. Maybe frustration, agitation, you know, you know, you're, you know, you're, uh, you know there's a rage. There, there's different forms of, of uh, anger. So in different people, it, it happens in different ways. The problem is not, it, one, one size doesn't fit everybody. So, you know, where one person is going, I don't like it, I can't stand it, but you know, we're gonna, we're gonna get along, it, it, it'll happen. Another guy's going, I'm about to pull my hair. And so you take this guy and you put him in a house with the two kids and the wife, it's not a happy day, you know? And so all of a sudden, then you go, well, he's gotta stop that. Well, it's easier said than done. You know, and now this guy's upset and he's angry and, um, and, and the other person can, well, just calm down. Well, he might come down for a little bit, but people are made differently. We have different temperaments. We're made, we're made in different ways. And yes, there's the power of the Holy Spirit and, and the power of God and, and what will we do without him? But, but if, if there's a person, if you find that there, the anger reaches a level where you're going, this is really out of control, that is a very high form of a, uh, anxiety. And you need to talk, I mean, maybe not you, I'm not, not saying this is you, but you need to talk with someone um, who can walk you through that because these are some of the creative things we're, going, we're having to do. Be, there's, there are some states that don't have a problem with things and there are other states like here at New York State that every, every day we're finding they're not allowing another state to come in and we need work done and we need stuff done. and. And now we can't bring people in. It's it's frustrating. And that's small stuff in comparison to what other people are going through. I think so, it's um, for me, it's frustrating. Uh, my anger kind of dissolves into just frustration because the anger, I'm a big believer in following the science for sure. And I think there's a beautiful meld between faith and science, by the way. But the science is like, you got to believe the science. The problem frustration that I have that at first made me really mad, but now it's it's almost frustration like whatever is that you never know. I think the science, the numbers can be and are kind of spun however the presenter wants to present the numbers in science to where it will favor one side or whatever their belief is about what to do. So that's really where the frustration is. So, and I don't know, it's, it's easy to just kind of throw in the towel and, and just sort of like toe the line, but I don't know, it just kind of like, I wouldn't say I get really blown up anger about it, but it's just kind of like, oh, here we go again. And I agree with you about New York State, by the way, that my wife works for the University of Rochester and they are having class, which everyone, my daughter also is not having class. She goes to school at Southern New Hampshire University. They made a, a statement early on that they weren't gonna be in session. It'll be all online, which wreaked havoc with the parents. Like, why, why can't you do that? And we were one of them like, Oh, come on, can't be that bad. Can't you just make adjustments? I mean, my wife is now helping another group that deals with incoming freshmen and international students. And because things are changing day by day, like you said, like states are being uh, added to the list of if you come in from that state, you have to quarantine for 14 days. So now you have to have all these incoming freshmen and students be somewhere for 14 days before they can begin classes. It's a way bigger thing than that. And you talk about anxiety. The parents and the and the kids that those that um, she works with on a daily basis now are just it. You feel really bad for them, so it gives her an opportunity to minister and kind of you know console them a little bit. But um, yeah, to me again, I mean, it's kind of like the frustration. Yeah. Yeah, to think I get, I think we can make this statement and be safe. 
to think that science and politics has not collided, you have to be living on the moon. <laughs> Clearly, they have. And the closer yes. we get to November 4th, it, it, it's, and we are, we are all the people caught in the middle. So who knows what it's going to look like after mm -hmm. that? We have no idea, but it, it has. Those two worlds have collided. It's rather clear they have. And then out of that is both the frustration and the fear factor. And uh, then the legitimacy uh, of the of the pandemic. So yeah, I'm I'm with you. It's it, we have options, and there's things yeah. we can do. Yeah. Well, well, thanks everybody. Hey, um, Dr. Fred, you want to give us a quick update on the school and uh, um, anything you want to share on the PBI and C? Yeah. Well, we are going to have classes. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> we are by the grace of God, and so, uh, but we'll do the social distancing and they have to wear the masks and all this. And, and if there is somebody sick, we have failing hall, we're going to put them and we're working with the state. And so we'll, there is, there is things that they want a person to do. And they, poor Danuta, she gets all of these new things every day. She's got like two big files this thick. And so she got to take stuff out and put stuff in. And, um, but some of it's vague, you know, some of it leaves you with, all right, are you saying this or are you saying that? And it's almost like the state is saying, um, I don't know, you do what you need to do. And if you make a mistake, we'll tell you or something like that. So it's very frustrating. Um, but the school is going well. We are doing uh, uh, real, real short. My job here, I mean, I didn't, I never thought I was going to be president of Elam. Never, it was, I never aspired to be president of Elam Bible Institute in college. I love it. I was on the board of directors, but it was not on my to-do list. And uh, it just happened that it was God, you know, um, a couple of board members came. I turned it down, turned it down about a year and a half ago. And uh, then uh, a couple of board members came to me uh, this time last year and said, listen, this is, uh, this is God. And uh, it was, God just spoke to my heart and um, I love it. Uh, so we sold a practice, sold everything we had. And we're up here like a lot of people do. Uh, the school is, uh, is going well. Uh, we're down in students. Uh, but then again, uh, we have a brand new marketing and development department that Elam has never had. Somebody gave me a rather large amount of money to build our own marketing and development, which is awesome. We've never had a marketing and development. Leah uh, Wilson is ahead of it. And I work directly. That's the only department that's directly linked to the president. And so we went from like six pages deep in, in Google buried someplace when you Google Bible college or charismatic Bible college or Pentecostal to first page about 12 down. We have been, we've come a long way getting like 330,000 impressions and we're getting KPIs, a lot of stuff is happening. The, uh, we're getting the bell tower back up. Uh, we're believing for a, a much better year. It's gonna take uh, Dr. Steve Green of the Charisma Magazine. They've done a couple of cover stories on my presidency, which was most about Elam actually. Uh, Dr. Steve Green is the publisher of a Charisma Magazine. He was also the, uh, Dean of Business at Oral Roberts University when Mark Rutland went there. He is now on our board of directors. Awesome. And so that's a, that's a major thing. You know, Charisma is a real big believer because of the Elam, Genesee Wesley and Charles Finney connection. And so uh, we're hopeful to make a long story short, we're hopeful we need a lot. Is If there's anybody at, let me make this plea. If you, if you ladies and guys, if you know of anybody in your church, you know of anybody that can do some masonry work, um, that um, do, can do some carpentry. Uh, we need you so desperately right now. Um, uh, and we got to be in the state of New York, you know. But if, if you have anybody, you know anybody, if you could let us know, uh, we could really use some right now. I could save us some money. But August 29th, we have our graduation, our incoming new students, the returning students, and they're doing a formal installation of me with, the, I guess, me and Pastor Mike with it. But Tom passing. So at the end of the day, it's all good. We're believing the Lord. We're building Elam. It's going to go national, not just our within the Elam confines, but I think we're going to be doing other things nationally with Elam. So we're just stoked about it. Awesome. Well, great grace to you. I'm thrilled that you're here on the Hill. I do believe you're the, the guy for the time. So we'll be standing with you. It's not an easy task that you have there, but uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining us. Today Thank you. Went a, it's been wonderful. a little longer, but I think it was really some good conversation. And again, you can view all of our huddles if you subscribe to the Elon Fellowship YouTube channel. Um, we've been doing them all.
through COVID here, um, from parenting to pastoring. Um, so join those up. Uh, just real quick, uh, we have a couple more coming up in August. Um, we have um, uh, Randy Stewart on August 12th doing one on discipleship. And then at the end of the month on the 26th, Alex Seidler, our global director, is going to be doing one on relationships. And, um, and then I'm doing one on the, the 13th uh, with youth leaders and kid leaders, just giving them an update on Saturate, what we're doing with Saturate this year in November. Uh, we are going to have it, but it's going to be a virtual thing. Um, and so we're going to look in for some regional um, sites or churches just to host uh, Saturate as we live stream it. But uh, I'll give an update on all that. Find all of our stuff on our website as well. Uh, again, thanks to Dr. Fred um, and uh, for sharing his heart. Really appreciate him and his time and you guys for joining us. God bless you all. And uh, Dr. Fred, will you just pray for us as we close this out? And, uh, I'd be honored to. <clears throat> Father, I thank you so much for these men and women. They're such a blessing. It's been just so, oh, so, so enjoyable to talk with them. And I'm not sure what help I've done, but God, I thank you for them and the work that they do. And uh, Father, what you've called them to and the challenges that they have and, and uh, with their families, with their marriages, with their uh, children, with, uh, in their singleness, whatever uh, they, they find themselves in, Lord, bless them, be with them and help them to be creative and, and through all of this pandemic and, and uh, give them great grace and strength and vitality. And Lord, give them more than anything else, uh, a double portion of your Holy Spirit God, and ignite them as we believe you for revival, God, to set the hearts and lives of men and women, young men and women free. Yes. And, and uh, Lord, through all of this, we're going to trust you because even through this pandemic, Lord, we trust you to get rid of this thing, God, and let there be, if nothing else, uh, sound minds in this country to begin to make decisions that can consider uh, the citizenry. So, Jesus, do this. We trust you. We thank you in advance. And we look to you to do good and wondrous things in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, just Miriam put up in her comic, uh, comment there, and I want to um, just echo it that uh, Dr. Fred's book on Struggling Well is a great read if you can pick that up. Dr. Fred, where can they grab that? Just on. Well, first, thank you, Miriam. Appreciate that. Um, you can find it on right there. He's got Amazon. It. It's also on christianbook.com. It's, re it's really cheap. Um, so any, any of those two, there's, there's a couple other sources, but christianbook.com it's quite cheap. If you do Amazon, if you like it, if you could give me a review, that would be great. If you don't like it, just do me no harm. <laughs> do not, say nothing. <laughs> it does speak to some of, it talks about relationships and how we struggle as human beings and Christians, but we can struggle well. And so thank you, Mary. Awesome. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. God bless thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Antonelli. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Blessings to all of you. Bye-bye. God bless.